the session that I want to present now is about something that if you attended the band session, he's uh, more about the future thing. So alpha code running on a um, non-production service, it's fine. But very often you have situation like I had in my organization where um, you have heavy Linux shop with some Windows servers or you have Linux folks that need to do something on Windows, but they don't really want to uh, start using the Windows tools for do that. And, you know, the conversation very often is so that, you know, you have this Linux guy showing up at your door and he says, I heard about this thing, Ansible, it's awesome. Just do this thing, just disable the, uh, any protection on your Windows because, well, who cares about protection on Windows? And uh, the way they view you, maybe, is that you are just this, uh, you know, not very nice figurine that does this magic thing on uh, visual stuff where he likes to command, right? He likes the commands. You are the one that just do some magic tricks. And um, fortunately, uh, the place where I work is far uh, from that. We actually have uh, partnership conversations. So we are almost equal, I would say. So when they showed up at my door and asked me, okay, Bartek, we have this thing Ansible. Do you think we can do that? They weren't really like, you had to, we have to do it. Yeah, we, maybe we can do that. Maybe it's fine. And I said, well, okay, let me investigate how, how we can do that. And that's where we started to have a conversation, friendly conversation, you know, uh, love and peace. And uh, we eventually ended up with something that is, I would say, secure enough for us to feel comfortable about it running on our server. Server, let's, let's, let's focus on that because uh, the problem with the uh, Ansible is that they would expect you to run it on every server. So they would expect you to lower the, your, your security on every server that you have. But uh, we managed to kind of do it differently. And that's basically the story I have to, for today. Uh, I initially planned to uh, inject a little bit about uh, partial remoting and uh, SSH and, and uh, the, the um, uh, WS man remoting from uh, Linux. But I decided, okay, because you have this band session just before me and he probably will master it because he knows how to do that, I should probably just, just leave it to him and just, just focus on what I actually know. And this is something that you can take home and start using immediately. So I think that's kind of beneficial for you too. Even though it's not really that PowerShellish, so you don't force or convince your uh, Linux admins to start running PowerShell on the Linux boxes and do something from that. Um, so the scenario that we had was, uh, we had actually a few scenarios. The one that we started with was that the guys from the uh, from our Linux boxes that wanted to have some kind of, uh, um, I would say, they wanted to rebuild servers, but while doing that, they wanted to change DNS records so that uh, CNAME that used to point to server A started to point to server B. And uh, the idea was, okay, if we do that, we want to have some kind of easy way to talk to DNS server, which runs on Windows in our case. Uh, and tell it, okay, this is the moment where I really want to see a name to stop pointing to the server A and start pointing to server B. Uh, so we investigated the different solutions and we kind of uh, landed on this PyWinRM because first of all, it was running in Python. It's just a, a package that you have to install on the server that starts this, the process. So, and it's actually a part of Ansible. So we use Ansible at work. Therefore, it was kind of no brainer to use the uh, PyWinRM as well. Um, uh, and for the future, obviously, we, we think about using PowerShell and PSRP, but that's for future. And the reason why we want to do that with PSRP is because uh, when you uh, allow anybody to connect to your server, you want to control what this person can do on the server. You don't want to uh, let this person go wild and do anything he wants. Uh, because like for majority of people, that's not a problem, but you will always have this uh, kind of... Uh, you know, careless person that just, let's see what happens if I start in restart server. Will it restart server or not? Yeah, and uh, uh, few, next few minutes are probably crucial to your company if you are unlucky. Uh, and we'll look into the, the, some pitfalls that we kind of uh, hit along, along our way to get the, this WinRM 
uh, or, or actually PyWin RAM work on us for us on, on Linux and talking to Windows. Uh, so we want to have Linux in control. So that's 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 the, the main major part part. Uh, Windows is doing the job, so this is the DNS server that has to be there. Uh, seamless experience was also important, so I didn't want to uh, make them feel like they do something unusual. So that uh, uh, we started with something that didn't seem and didn't look like a, a Linux command. In the end, we landed with something that really feels and, and looks like it would just like it just runs on Linux. You don't even feel and know that you are actually targeting Windows. And uh, the important bit was that I didn't want to kind of ignore the security altogether. Um, we did made some some uh, things that I'm not really proud of, but still, I think that it was uh, the way to go. So it was relatively easy, and still, uh, the security was actually uh, on the table. Uh, so first demo, it will be. Uh, um, let's take a look at about uh, the um, Python on Windows. Uh, sorry, Python talking to Windows, so we enter Windows from Python. Okay, let's move to Linux box. Uh, before I start using it, I will show you hopefully how you install it. Uh, I try to make sure that I have internet just before the demos, but if it doesn't work, fortunately I recorded the whole thing in a hotel where I actually had internet that worked. Uh, so in worst case scenario, I can just play the movie. So let's start first with the live demo, and if it doesn't work, at least we have uh, exit gateway. So uh, some of, if some of you uh, attended my session yesterday, uh, you know why I did it. Uh, so install by WinRM. So. First off, uh, by the way, uh, is the font readable from the back? Okay. I see Joey is like, uh, now? Okay. Uh, so first we need to use, to be able to use pip. And it's not uh, in the standard CentOS. I'm actually using CentOS most of the time because it's a distribution that I kind of get uh, familiar with and I don't want to learn all the tricks like uh, different uh, package managers because yeah, I'm lazy. Uh, so. Um, so we will just use uh, yum to install epil release. It's this, I think it's the same repo that you use, right? So if you use uh, CentOS, you probably want to install it anyway because there are so many useful packages in it. And one of them is actually the Python pip. So well, I'm also installing the prerequisites for the uh, for the PyWin RAM basically because it's actually I'm gonna use it with Kerberos authentication. Therefore. I need to be able to use Kerberos. Uh, it uses some Python development uh, libraries as well, so I need those too. Uh, I, I need a C++ compiler because it actually compiles something on the fly when you specify the uh, PyWin RAM version that I actually want to use. Uh, and some Kerberos developed, so it actually has some libraries for the Kerberos. Uh, so it's all, all those things are required. I think on the uh, pip package page they skipped uh, for some reason Python devil in the requirements. Uh, so you be, have to be careful if you read the computation for this pip package. Uh, they don't mention Python devil for CentOS. They do mention it for uh, for the uh, Debian uh, uh, like uh, distribution. So I think that's just just a typo. Uh, and as you can see, I didn't dare to install it now, so it's already installed there. Um, so the PyWin RAM. So I sudo pip install PyWin RAM, and um, once this is done. Um, and as you can see, your requirements already satisfied. Uh, so it was installed already. Uh, now we can actually start using our script. So I will console it that now. Um, so now we have uh, PyWin RAM installed. Therefore, we can start uh, talking to our Windows boxes. Um, so first, we will just try to see the very basic script. So if you are a Python developer, please close your eyes or at least try to treat it with the grain of, like, just, just be gentle, okay? Uh, I'm not a Python developer, so I wrote a very simple Python. It's really like bare, uh, and it doesn't use any uh, uh, any nice uh, uh, parks, arc parse finis. It's just using the arc v here. Uh, the point is that I kind of hide the whole the logic that has to be done with to create a session. And as you can see, I started immediately. That's, that was like 
uh, if anything, I want to don't I don't want to have transport basic authentication used there. I want to have at least Kerberos covered. Um, the reason being that it's well, first of all, uh, I don't want the plain text passwords stored on disk. Uh, I don't want uh, plain text passwords traveling over network. Uh, I rather have something that is at least feels safer. So that's why we use Kerberos here. Uh, but before we run it, obviously, to use uh, uh, Kerberos, I need to have Kerberos ticket present on my Linux box. So I just connect to kinit uh, to, uh, to uh, my domain controller. The point is that if you, uh, if you want to automate those stuff, you can create a keytop file on Linux. Uh, I didn't include the demo for that one. I probably will just add it to the uh, Git repository so that you can actually see how, it, how, it, how, can it, how that can be done. Uh, because it's very, very handy. You just save the file, you probably put it in a location that's safe, like .ssh. So you treat it similar, similarly to your uh, SSH keys. So you treat them as something that actually allows others to uh, authenticate as you. Okay, let me type in the password. Hopefully no typos there. Um, and yeah, important thing is this, uh, the caps here is not because I'm rude and I want to scream out that my name, uh, domain is modded. Uh, actually, the, the Linux will take uh, care about it. So if I would use lowercase, it will actually not work. Uh, next off, uh, we will try it to, to give it a try. Uh, just just connect and see the, just ls remotely. As you can see, uh, I got uh, C user blf uh, Reason being that I actually, uh, well, I just connect as the user that I just uh, k-in it with. Therefore, I'm connecting as this user to remote endpoint. Squeaky, squeaky. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, the double hop is still an issue unless we change something, but let's first not change it. And if we try it, then it will just, just blow up in our faces. Uh, fortunately, there is a easy fix for that one. So uh, the Pywin uh, RAM in the connection uh, methods actually allows you to specify that you want the Kerberos delegation to be present. And if your uh, uh, Kerberos ticket on your Linux box is uh, forwardable, so the F flag is there, you can forward it to the next machine. Therefore, if we just uh, add this uh, thing to Kerberos delegation to our another script, delegate WinRAM, then I can ra run this delegate WinRAM. It's very similar to the, the previous one, so it's as bad as the previous one. The only difference is that I added this Kerberos delegation. So now if I try it, it, I actually get the host name from my domain controller. So now the second hop is kind of no, no brainer, no issue. Uh, so the pitfalls that I mentioned. Uh, first of all, uh, issue is the length of the command. Uh, so the way PowerWinRAM is running your commands, PowerShell commands, is that they actually take your snippet of code, they will convert it to a base64 string, and pass it on to PowerShell.exe. And the reason why they do that like that is because PyWinRAM is actually, uh, I would say, Python implementation of WinRS. Have any of you used WinRS in the past? Okay, just a few hands. So just to, 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 uh, to, to explain what it is, in Windows 2008, there was uh, WinRAM already present. There was no partial remoting back in the days, but uh, there was actually already a command, WinRS, that allowed you to connect to the remote endpoint using WinRAM, uh, default WinRAM endpoint, and run the commands over there. Um, the problem with this one is obviously, if you think, okay, uh, I think there was a question of to, to you, Ben, about uh, constraint endpoints. Well, if you just connect to the default endpoint on WinRAM, obviously constraint endpoints are not an option. But also another thing, you connect to CMD, you don't connect to PowerShell. Therefore, to run a PowerShell, you have to call powershell.exe or anything else that will call powershell on your behalf and tell it to run your script. So the problem that we will see in a minute is that if I have a code that is long, but not long enough, I actually get the results. But if I cross the line, so I, I think it's bridging the 4KB uh, line length for the cmd.exe. So if you cmd.exe, your line gets too long, uh, cmd will just blow up in your face. Uh, and that's exactly what happens if you do that with uh, Pinewind RAM as well. So uh, now you have your very nice script, <coughs> sorry, written in PowerShell, 
but you cannot run it on uh, uh, using the PyWinner RAM because it's too long. And that's definitely not something you want to uh, struggle with. So there are easiest, the, the easiest solution, obviously, is just have the script present on the remote box, which and then it doesn't really, uh, it's not important how big the script is. So here I wrote a very nice script, which is just, uh, I used the Lorem Ipsum uh, Presley API, where you can just request as long as you want. Dropped it in the file, made it as, uh, as a here string, so my script doesn't do anything special. The point is that it actually has uh, 1,500 characters. If you look above, uh, those uh, commands were not even close to that, that number. But if I run the script remotely now, uh, it just works. The reason being that I just call this, uh, this script remotely, therefore the, my command line uh, it's limited to this path to the script. Um, okay, the next issue that I noticed uh, was that, uh, okay, you have your uh, credentials protected, but your data is not. So, um, if you have something in your output from your command that, um, that contains sens sensitive information, Let's say you just echo some file that contains uh, plain text password. Let's say you have full server that you, and you want to use it with partials. If you use it with partials, you probably have plain text passwords in the partials because you cannot really make it work with certificates so much because you would have to have the same certificate all over the place. Uh, in other case, you j basically just, just uh, the, the information that travels over the network is, is kind of something that you want to protect too. Uh, in partial remoting, we or uh, partial team actually make sure that it's protected no matter what. So you don't need SSL protection. But with the PyWin RAM, you actually want that. So uh, here I'm trying to uh, just just have small TCP dumps, so I'm almost like sniffing the network traffic. And if I just uh, run the script and try to call something, as you can see, I got the information back. So this, uh, this is prefix is a CLI XML, so it shows that it's actually coming from the uh, P, uh, PyWinRM, uh, sorry, from WinRM stack. And then you have, can see that actually I got this my protected data back as well as a part. It's base64 encoded, but that's not a big issue, right? So I just, as you can see uh, above, I just kind of uh, use regex to get it out. Thank you. <laughs> I will use it afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I have this regular expression that actually allows me to take out the, the base64 part of it, and then I just convert to back to the uh, plain text using base64 command. Um, so in the reality, you probably don't want that. I mean, 99% of the time you wouldn't care, I guess. Because first of all, you probably would write your commands so that they don't output uh, info, uh, the sensitive information. And on top of that, you probably would write them in a way that, well, by, by definition, they don't return anything. They just return errors when they have to. Um, but we decided, okay, let's just, just use SSL because we can. But uh, to use SSL, you first need to change some things on your Windows box. Not exactly how I plan it. I guess. Give me a sec. I need to get to the, my favorite editor, which is not Visual Studio Code. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Thank you. Let's wait for IC Stroids to load. By the way, any questions so far? while it loads. Why didn't you guys help me like that? I mean, when Ben asks for the question, you have so many. Okay. I should probably just shut up. Um, okay, so the, f the important thing that you have to do is make sure, actually that's for delegation, let's skip it for now. Um, but we will need that in the future, but for now, 
you need to configure your uh, certificate. So you need to get certificate from the trusted source. Uh, and for the most majority of the situations, for the majority of scenarios, you don't gonna go to GoDaddy and request a proper signed certificate that everybody will trust. You don't really ha want to spend money on it, I guess. And I hope that you have some big PKI present in your organization. Therefore, you want to try to use that one to get your certificate uh, and assign it to, uh, to the uh, WinRM endpoint. So you just get the certificate and then you just, uh, you just have to create. By the way, this code will be also on the uh, GitHub repo. So um, you just get uh, the certificate information. I won't do that now because I don't want to risk that it will actually break everything. Uh, anyway, this SSL endpoint is something that you just create an, as an item in WS man uh, localhost listener. So you just create another listener that will listen on SSL port, uh, which is 5986. And um, in the end, it means that you can connect with HTTPS uh, to your uh, WinRM stack. Uh, it will work with partial remoting which we cannot use here, but it will work uh, regardless. So you can use it for SIM, you can use it for uh, any kind of connection that you, you are pleased with. Um, we'll go back to this guy once we get to delegation. Or we want, okay. Um, so this is the issue uh, with the protected data. So now let's move on to solution for that protected data. Actually, I don't want to skip any slides because my kids will kill me if I do. I mean, they work so hard. So this is uh, when you really want to make sure that Linux is not doing anything uh, unusual. And um, uh, we will uh, talk about protection SSL, but also about delegation. So how you would do that so you don't have this domain admin account running on the Linux and with the K in it, because probably that's not something you would like to do. Um, Back to demos. So, uh, the problem is that if you want to use SSL, there will be a problem with uh, CA. So, we just changed a little bit. Uh, my session, as you can see now, is pointing to HTTPS endpoint. Uh, by the way, if you want to use HTTPS, uh, sorry, uh, SSL and Kerberos at the same time, uh, the only way to do that is actually to m m specify full path because uh, um, the PyWinRM is actually assuming that if you uh, if you specify uh, just Kerberos over in the transport, it will assume the, that you want to connect to HTTP endpoints. Uh, so you have to be really specific there. So just specify uh, the protocol, but also the port. As you can see at the end, there is 5896. 5986, yes. Uh, so the problem is the CA because uh, the way PyWinRM works, it uses the uh, Python request underneath it, under, under the hood. And uh, Python request has very interesting approach to uh, certificates. So they decided, okay, we don't, don't care what your system will tell us uh, that it's trusted. We'll trust our own uh, list of certificates. So they have their own uh, PEM file with uh, all the certificates that they trust. Uh, so you have actually few options to fix it. The first one would just be to ignore cert validation. You probably don't want to do that, but if you insist, then uh, the only thing you would have to do is just change your script so now it says server cert validation ignore. And that will, would work. So if you just don't want to mess up with the uh, Python request or Python RAM code base, you have to change your script or have uh, this GoDaddy certificate that I mentioned initially. Um, so I, I actually showing the uh, request CS, CSR to prem, which is the file that they use. As you can see, this one is not messed up. I haven't touched it at all. Uh, and if I run the command now, it just works. The next off is you can modify requests. So you go to requests, module. Uh, it works until you update it, I guess, because then you have to do that again. Um, and you just add your CA to the PEM file that I just mentioned. I'm kind of uh, wild here. I'm going like, uh, 
I don't care about your certificates at all. I just want mine. Therefore, I don't change the script. So now we had, I don't add any flex to the sessions per, uh, method. But what I do is actually point the uh, CI assert pen to my f own file that contains uh, a certificate. And uh, to get the certificate, we actually go, have to go back to Windows. Let me just open that very quickly. Very quickly, it's very um, depends on which side of the toilet are you standing, I guess. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, let's just do it from Linux then. I had it somewhere. Sec, I want to show you how you can actually generate this uh, PEM file so you can actually then drop it on uh, your Linux box and just use it. So the way you would do that <coughs> sorry, is to get the certificate and then you have to uh, do this. Uh, actually, th that, that we can run. That's not a problem. So if I just do that, I get a file that is basically... Um, Keyboard, great. Exactly what I wanted. Um, it's a little bit. So it's basically just just this uh, base 64 kind of format for uh, your certificate, and you can drop it on your Linux box. And once you do that, you can just um, replace the certificate that the uh, request will use, and then with the same uh, command, not modified script at all, you get the same uh, same results. And last but not least, you can modify PyMRM because there's actually two pull requests now open that would fix that. And I think the one, uh, I, I've used one that was most, more recent because the guy who actually uh, suggested this pull request, he tried to make it uh, play nicely with all the, uh, the elements of the system. Uh, so I just applied his patch to my uh, own uh, package locally. And uh, this, is, this, this means that I can specify CI, CI <coughs> trust path and point it to file that I want it tr to trust. So I tell it, okay, this is the file that you should trust. And no matter what the request thinks that you should trust, this is the one I think is trustworthy. Uh, and if I do that the same, as you can see, I'm not touching the uh, request CI, CI cert pen. It's the same that was, uh, as it was installed with. But if I do the run the command now, it just works. Um, so now the delegation part. So we will use this uh, uh, buses operator from hell kind of person. So we will destroy our ticket. We'll create the new one just for this user. And this user has nothing, no special rights in domain. He's a just, just domain user. Uh, he happens to be member of groups, group or two. And these groups are actually configured to be able to, first of all, they have to be configured to talk to WinRAM on this box. So the, the box, the Windows box that you talk to, have to allow them to connect. But on top of that, I will try to use Jia to uh, configure uh, another box. So not the, the, the initial box, but another box that will have uh, all the logic that this, this user can, can run uh, on behalf of somebody else. Therefore, uh, he will be able to do his work. Uh, he, his uh, credentials, everything will end up on this jump box that you, you configured uh, and stay there. Uh, they won't travel farther than that. And even if somebody gets this, uh, this init file, he won't be able to like, log into every computer in your domain, like it was previously with, this, uh, with my domain admin account. So if I try to run... Uh, Kless, I just get now that I have completely different uh, token. If we try to do something with DC now, because it's a user that has lower privile privileges in domain, it obviously told me, sorry, um, access is denied for you. Uh, 
But fortunately, we can use this uh, GI endpoints instead. So if I try that, so I try to list the commands that are available to me uh, on this uh, uh, constrained uh, GI configured endpoint. Um, takes a while. I hope it's not because the, the server is dead. Let me see. Um, Um, uh, I guess that's, that's the reason why. I noticed that before, yesterday. So the moment that uh, my internet connection on my host uh, disappears, all PyWinner RAM commands just slow down. So I will just probably just disable for now the, the network card because we don't need internet anymore. And I wasn't expecting that to fail in the middle of presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's just use the... So I'll just disable this guy for now, and I hope that it will be sufficient to make it stop uh, messing up my my code. Okay, so now I will try to run another command. If it's slow, still you have to bear with me. So in the end, I just uh, kind of wrap up the functionality you have in the DNS server module, and kind of heed all the parameters that the guy that I intended it to use don't need to have. Added some uh, validation of parameters. So I validated, okay, if he tries to add CNAME, that's something that already has CNAME, I will tell him to go somewhere else. Uh, if uh, the CNAME that he wants to create points to an existing A record or uh, the host that I cannot really ping at the moment, I will also stop. So there was a lot of logic that uh, on our side, on Windows side, that help uh, prevent any uh, damage that the uh, script could cause if we would just go wild and follow the instructions. Um, but yeah, I could just, okay, I hope that will work. <laughs> I'm not sure if I removed uh, the record from the DNS. Yeah, I believe I did. So as you can see, I just added this uh, the DNS record for psconfigu. If I look it up, I actually have two of them because I was testing, so <laughs> I forgot to remove the other one. Anyway, uh, as you can see, I just allowed from the Linux user that doesn't have any domain rights at all uh, to run, uh, to mess up with my DNS in a way that I think is, first of all, useful for him, but it's safe from my point of view. And um, yeah, we can allow the things to, 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 to break things as well. So here I'm allowing the user to actually remove a record as well. So this assumption will be that, okay, it has to be more uh, advanced and, and smart person that just does that. And he knows the, the potential problems that may arise if he does do that. And uh, well, it just has to be safe from this point of view. And to make it more convenient, you can actually uh, hide all this uh, extra logic. Because as you can see here, I now have the script. I say ICM, I specify the computer name, I specify uh, configuration. So that w wouldn't fly with our Linux admins. So what we did is actually uh, we just wrote some kind of Python script. And this one I wrote, but it's, I tried to kind of follow the, the, the logic that my colleague who actually writes some Python occasionally did. So that's why you have the click instead of uh, just going crazy with uh, um, uh, the uh, argv and stuff like this. Anyway, the script, the point of the script is that you uh, you just hide all the logic that normally you would need. And the, the user, the way he would run it, is just, well, first of all, he gets some help. So we can see what the parameters are available, what he can do with it. Uh, but we can also do uh, this and I just echoed now the command that he really runs, but uh, in practice, yeah, I was expecting that to happen. Uh, in practice, I didn't clean up the environment, therefore he couldn't create another pointer with the same. Anyway, uh, pra in practice, it means that he can run this command and doesn't feel like it's he's doing something like with PowerShell, with all the squiggly, squig squigglies and uh, you know the, the ICM, what the hell is that? He just runs the command that he, he is familiar with and just gets the help he would expect. 
So as you can see, the, 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 the record is there. It's just that it was there before, I guess. That's why I couldn't really remove it. Um, so yeah. That's the delegation part. Now, I want to show you also, because I just focused on the Linux side of things, uh, but obviously there's a second part of the story, right? So it's not just uh, that you have to configure stuff on uh, Linux to make it work. I mentioned, mentioned Gia, so you want to configure Gia up front to make it work. So uh, let me show you briefly this uh, thing I planned to show before. Uh, so this is basically, I'm not sure if it's visible. Anyway, it says that the group uh, PSR DSN, DNS admin DLG has rights to read and execute this default uh, default endpoint, which is uh, uh, in terminology of WinRM is just 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 default. Uh, you can see the same results, I believe, in uh, WS Man. I don't remember exactly the location now. I will probably look it up and, and probably when I posted the whole thing on the GitHub, I will add the command that you can just do that without the extra GUI stuff on top of that. Uh, next thing you have to do is just prepare your, prepare your GIA endpoint, and that's what I would do on this DC2. Uh, here is just the code so you can see how more or less it works. So the, 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 the point is that you would create a folder uh, under the um, PowerShell modules folder that is shared across all the machine, which is just uh, C, program files, Windows PowerShell modules. Uh, the folder name is uh, for Gia is not important at all. It can be anything. Underneath it, there has to be folder called uh, roles, role capabilities. Uh, I'm doing much more here because I actually had uh, the uh, commands, so all this add a record, uh, uh, remove a record in this module as well. Therefore, I wanted to have proper module as well uh, in there. Uh, so yeah, I create the directory, I create the, uh, the PSM1 file, then I just um, add the manifest for this, um, and then I create the roles folder, and in this roles folder I need to create this uh, DNS admin PSRC file, uh, and we can actually probably run it, it won't really help us much because we don't really have anything special on this one. Uh, I'm not sure if it will work, let's see. Yeah, of course, I didn't have a module path. Probably didn't change the volume yet, right? Do, do, do. Okay, um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I guess that does one fly. Um, anyway, the, the point is that if you go to this uh, module, I think I should have it here. <sighs> Let me just change the keyboard to the... I don't mind Polish keyboard, but it has to be proper Polish keyboard, not the... And this just messes up all your, uh, you know, um, usual uh, keys. So program files, Windows PowerShell, modules, DNS admin. As you can see, I have the stroke capabilities here. So actually, we can edit that. And um, if you use the the uh, configuration files in PowerShell version 3 and above. You probably remember that there was uh, two parts to it. There was configuration of the endpoint itself that was uh, just saying which type of endpoint you want to create, uh, which version of uh, PowerShell you want to use, do you want to have uh, some things uh, enabled for the remoting endpoint. And there was a second part where you would define what commands people can use. So in V5 with GIA, uh, those two things were separated. So now we have the configuration file that just defines the endpoint features and, uh, uh, well, just basically how it should behave. And the second part to it, the, the, whole, uh, the whole definition of the commands are kept in the roles file. And the roles file can be multiple and different users can have multiple roles. That means that if you want to expose commands X, Y, and Z to user A, but you want to expose uh, command A and B to user Q, uh, then you would have just two, uh, two uh, items in your, in your list of uh, capabilities. You wouldn't have, and two capabilities that kind of match those commands. 
So commands will go to group capabilities in your configuration of your endpoint. You would specify this group has this rights. This group, uh, sorry, this, this uh, capabilities. This group has different capabilities. You can use users and groups. I would obviously recommend groups because it's always easier to maintain it later. Um, so this configuration file more or less now looks like that. You basically have just uh, the, the basic options. And if you create it, um, you just get a file. And the point is that here you just have to specify, okay, who and which role capabilities this user has. Uh, and all the things like language mode and uh, session type, you would specify still in the configuration of the endpoint itself. Um, let me check, this one was already covered. We did that one too. Um, oh yeah, we can actually use it. This look at this one. So what I did here actually is just specify visible things, and I think this one is just blank, unfortunately. But uh, I have the similar one on my domain controller, so we can actually try to use the functionality that we have. TSN DC2. CD in program files, Windows PowerShell. By the way, if you want to discover what uh, capabilities you have, uh, I mentioned the logic that, that is currently used. I hope that it will change because it breaks when you want to distribute your roles with a uh, gallery. Because as you probably noticed, I just have a uh, module name uh, underneath the module path, and then underneath it is already role capabilities. But if you install module from the gallery, you'll have the version between the two. And row capabilities currently uh, don't support that, which is kind of depressing because you, it sounds like a perfect idea to just have those uh, capabilities stored in module in gallery and you just install it on the, the nodes that actually need it. Anyway, you cannot do that now. You have to use different methods to di distribute it. But if we go here, I believe uh, it will be sufficient to just do store role capabilities. Oh yeah, that's actually already completed and. For those of you who know Polish, you probably recognize the words. Sorry for that. I should probably change it. Um, if you didn't recognize, thank God. Um, let me open that using the remote editing functionality in ISC. And um, yeah, it's super simple now, right? So I just specify modules to import. This is DNS admin, which is the module that I actually using. So that's why I mentioned that I had to have all this PSM1, PSD1 files there as well. Uh, I specify visible aliases because I want the user to be able to use aliases instead of the full commands. But I also specify the visible functions. And that's how we, we configured in our organization. No, not really. Um, uh, <laughs> Something completely diff different. Uh, anyway, um, so the point is that the guys now, they, they can go to the Linux boxes, run this, I know, move CNAME command with special parameters. So they specify, this is the endpoint that you should start, this is the endpoint you should go, this is the CNAME I want to move. They run it and magic happens. So they run it on Linux boxes, but the result is that the Windows DNS is immediately updated uh, I, here I didn't show you all the logic about uh, within the, 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 the script. We also do something like, okay, we check with, uh, because we have multiple domain controllers obviously in our uh, location. So we go to the, the uh, domain controller, we check if the, the record is already stored in the, the uh, Active Directory. We go to the other domain controllers in the, in the site and just, just sync it. So where all the logic is like hidden, nobody has to remember all these commands. I just have it running on the, uh, on this uh, remoting endpoint. It's not GIA endpoint yet, because when I started with that, we were still running uh, the WMF4. Uh, but the plan is to actually move away everything to GIA once we are confident enough that it will work. Uh, and in the end, this, this Unix user just runs a relatively simple Python script and he gets the, what he wants. And he gets some uh, feedback from us. So if we see that what he would try to do is shouldn't work, or he shouldn't do that this way. For example, he tries to add the C name to something that already has a C name, which in this case is not really a solution because they uh, use the C names to kind of figure out which uh, server runs which application. And they normally have one application per server, which is uh, just to like probably abuse of the resources, but they, they like it like that. Uh, 
so they want to have this validation. We can do that for them. They don't have to do something crazy like pinging or whatever because we have all the, all the keys to the kingdom. We can go to the, the DNS server and tell, ask it, okay, give me all this information. I see, okay, there is a C name already pointing to this A record. Sorry, I don't gonna do that for you. So, yeah, let's close this environment and go back here. So, uh, PowerShell Linux is obviously the bright future, and I really want to go there. I already have some PowerShell running on my uh, private VM uh, organization and just test things. Like, for example, the, uh, the PowerShell UI that I mentioned, I actually was testing that in, with our proper VMware infrastructure, and it works really, really well. Uh, but the Python is export language of, of the present, right? It's something that uh, you can use both on Windows and Linux. Therefore, it's hard to convince people that they should just drop it and just start using PowerShell at this point in time. Uh, and I think it won't happen ever, but it's not really like visible, uh, sorry, a feasible option for uh, production code to use PowerShell because it's not really production uh, product yet. Um, uh, but I still think that export PowerShell is just the first step. So once we get it going, then we can start building on top of that. And with things like Geon Linux or connect, connecting to with uh, PowerShell uh, PSRP to uh, constraint endpoints where you can actually just completely ditch all this logic and have, don't use even the uh, jump box, it will be a really awesome thing to have. Uh, and with that, any questions? Yeah, I guess you are hungry and you just can't wait to get to lunch. And I'm with you. I, I normally eat like a, like a, I don't know, elephant. Um, so I probably will be, uh, will try to beat you to the lunch place. So be quick. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it says now 15 minute break. And I think that's not really the best slide for this point in time because the break is probably a bit longer. Uh, go grab a coffee or lunch. I will probably start with coffee. Um, and yeah, I also want to invite you because the, I mentioned Gia, but I kind of did it. Like if he, somebody who knows Gia would listen to me, he would probably just hold his head like this. It's like, oh no, that's not how it works. But you have good sessions about Gia still in front of us. Uh, where are you? Uh, okay, well, yeah, of course the internet doesn't work. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's a GIA session today by uh, Yap Browser, I think it's for something. And there is another one from uh, Alexander that I strongly recommend if you want to go deep on the GIA, uh, because he's a GIA expert. So you, if, if he says something is the, the way it is, it's, it's, he, he's probably right. Probably the documentation is, is outdated, not his um, making a mistake. And his session is tomorrow at 11. So I strongly encourage you to go to this one if you are interested in this delegation of uh, authorities and delegation of uh, rights on the Windows side. And once you have this GIA configured correctly, then you can use the PyWinRM and just hook those two things together and just get uh, the best of the world, both worlds. So thank you very much.